what a difference three days make. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, the photo in the front, which you'll see at the end as well, uh, comes from the statesman.com, which is a news uh, online part of a newspaper uh, from the area. And uh, a fellow by the name of Alberto Martinez uh, took the photo. Um, there's a Science Daily uh, release, obviously, from Science Daily itself. Um, about a canyon that's carved in just three days in Texas flood. Insight into the ancient into ancient flood events on Earth and Mars, and perhaps more insight than the writer realized. Um, this is from June 21, 2010, and the uh, link is above. Um, the source we have is the California Institute of Technology which means that the lead author of this paper has been, uh, uh, has written this. In the summer of 2002, a week of heavy rains in central Texas caused Canyon Lake, the reservoir of the Canyon Dam, to flood over its spillway and down the Guadalupe River in a planned diversion to save the dam from catastrophic failure. The flood excavated a 2.2 kilometer long, seven meter deep canyon in the bedrock. According to a new analysis, that canyon formed in just three days. For those of you who are in the English system, that's a mile and a half roughly and uh, about uh, 20, uh, 22, 23 feet deep. In the summer of 2002, a week of heavy rains in central Texas caused Canyon Lake, the reservoir of the Canyon Dam. I'm sorry. How did we get that? Okay. According to a new analysis of the flood and its aftermath performed by Michael Lamb, assistant professor of geology at Caltech, and Mark Fonstad of Texas State University, the canyon formed in just three days. A paper about the research appears in the June 20 advanced online edition of the journal Nature Geoscience, and we're going to take a look at that. Our traditional view of deep river canyons, such as the Grand Canyon, is that they are carved slowly as a regular flow and occasionally moderate rushing of rivers erodes rock over periods of millions of years. Such is not always the case, however. We know that some big canyons have been cut by large catastrophic flood events during Earth's history, Lamb says. Unfortunately, these catastrophic mega floods, which also may have chiseled out spectacular canyons on Mars, generally leave few telltale signs to distinguish them from slower events. Think about that. There are very few modern examples of mega floods, Lamb says, and these events are not normally witnessed. Or are there very few events? Um, so the process by which such erosion happens is not well understood. Nevertheless, he adds, the evidence that is left behind, like boulders and streamlined sediment islands, suggests the presence of fast water, although it reveals nothing about the time frame over which the water flowed. Um, now, well, he's talking in a relative sense. We're still talking about floods, but the question is how big, how fast, how much? Um, this is why the Canyon Lake flood is so significant. Here we know that all of the erosion occurred during the flood, Lamb says. Flood waters flowed for several weeks, but the highest discharge during which the bulk of the erosion took place was over a period of just three days. So this is basically three days and then a little water running through it afterwards. Lamb and Fonstad reached this conclusion using aerial photographs of the region taken both before and after the flood, along with field measurements of the topo topography of the region and measurements of the flood discharge. Then they applied an empirical model of the sediment carrying capacity of the flood, that is, the amount of soil, rocks, boulders, and other debris carried by the flood to produce the canyon. The analysis revealed that the rate of the canyon erosion was so rapid that it was limited only by the amount of sediment the floodwaters could carry. Those of you who were here a week ago may remember that uh, floodwaters that are already at capacity don't dig too much more. 
This is in contrast to models normally applied to rivers where the erosion is limited by the rate at which the underlying rock breaks and is abraded. So they're old models and they, they imply that it doesn't dig as fast as what we've actually witnessed. The researchers argue that the rate of erosion was rapid because the flood was able to pop out and car cart away massive boulders, a process called plucking, producing several 10 to 12 meter high waterfalls that propagated upstream toward the dam along with channels and terraces. We're going to see photos of some of those boulders. <coughs> The abrasion of rock by sediment-loaded waters, while less significant in terms of the overall formation of the canyon, produced other features like sculpted walls, plunge pools at the bases of the waterfalls, and teardrop-shaped sediment islands. The sediment islands are particularly significant, Lamb says, because these are features we see on Earth and on Mars. <coughs> Excuse me. In areas where we think large flow events have occurred, it's nice that we're here seeing some of the same features that we've interpreted elsewhere as evidence of large flow events. In other words, they have here confirmation of some of their theories. The results, Lamb says, offer useful insights into ancient megafloods, both on Earth and on Mars, and the deep canyons they left behind. I'm not reading the whole thing, of course. Um, this is one of a few places where models for canyon formation can be tested because we know the flood conditions under which this canyon formed. Now the story source is reprinted from materials provided by Caltech, um, which means that this is pretty much Lamb's production. Well, let me uh, show you an area, uh, the area in question. This is in Texas, and you can see Austin here and San Antonio here. We're coming in on Google Earth, and you see this little thing right over here. That's the canyon we're going to look at. We're going to zoom in on it, and you can see here the dam and the spillway, and although it's obscured by some of the little things that Google Earth puts on it, um, you can see uh, the overflow channel that's coming towards the normal channel, which is the Guadalupe River coming through here. And we'll uh, kind of zoom in on that area. Well, first, before we do it, let's take another look at the canyon. And this is, uh, this is before the flood. And you can see the main dam here. And then this little side dam, which has been modified so that it becomes a spillway, so that if this whole thing fills up, rather than overtopping the dam and possibly causing catastrophic failure, it, um, it will spill over this area, which is covered with concrete so that it's hard to erode. Well, this is what it looks like afterwards. And you can see the erosion where it's kind of collected from going over the spillway. Unfortunately, very wide and therefore very shallow and therefore not uh, too much erosion on the spillway itself. Otherwise, you'd have a catastrophic failure there. But uh, going down through the uh, what used to be a little valley uh, all the way to a bridge where it took it out, although it's been rebuilt, and we'll see that a little bit later. And, uh, and then it continues on until it hits the Guadalupe River. So that's, that's the canyon that was dug out. Well, it doesn't look that impressive from above, but maybe if we come down a little bit lower, you can see it better. Here's the, the, uh, the spillway itself. And if you look down along here, you can see where a great deal of uh, limestone rock has just been planed off and all the shrubbery is gone. There's a few little islands here that, that survived and then another part of it. And then once they join together, uh, here's th that uh, dam and spillway. You can see that it just cleaned out a huge canyon. And um, some places it'll go up to the uh, seven meters. In fact, there's a few places where it's actually 12 meters or about 39 uh, feet or so, almost 40 feet. And you can see coming through here, this is the same thing here. Up in here is where the spillway is. And, and uh, 
Now let's go back and you see this little water thing here and this pile up here, that's um, right there and we're backing off and then here this little uh, pool will show up in the next one up here. You can see it just, now you can see for scale, you know, car and uh, and this whole thing was just taken out. Um, and then, uh, and they rebuilt it with, uh, with a channel below it to allow uh, water to come through, although if they had another flood like that, it'd probably take it out again. Um, and it created a canyon that went all the way down to the Guadalupe River itself. Now, this looks pretty clean right now, but if you look at it while it was actually flooding, this is an aerial view. Um, this is um, some days after a while. It's, there's still water running through, but it's not... Uh, the canyon isn't anywhere near full. You can see that it's spread out onto this area here, uh, which is fairly low lying and easy f to flood over. And in fact, if you look at it, you can see here's the margin of the uh, of the silt that was dumped out. And there's a shot of the bridge, uh, just kind of taken right out, just gone. Uh, this is, again, while water is still flowing through it. Um, another place you can read about this um, is Live Science. And um, the title is Canyons Form Quickly, Recent Gusser Suggests, and it's by Brett Israel, again in June 20, uh, 2010. Some of the most spectacular canyons on Earth and Mars were probably formed in a geologic blink of an eye, suggests a new study that found clues to their formation deep in the heart of Texas. Lake Canyon Gorge, a 23-foot deep canyon in Como County, Texas, was carved in just three days by a flood in 2002. The flood scoured a swath of greenery, leaving sand-colored bedrock rubble in its wake. It was just a little V-shaped ditch. Uh, I don't know who added the ED on that bef before. But um, all that material was busted out during that event, said engineer Tom Horseth of Como County, Texas. Skipping on through, gorges are typically formed along pre-existing river channels. The Grand Canyon was formed as the Colorado River slowly wore down the bedrock. That probably took millions of years, though, said geologist and study co-author Michael Lamb of Caltech in Pasadena, California. Rapid Gorge carving is a baffling example of how incising bedrock doesn't take millions of years. At Lake Canyon Gorge, a single burst of water carried away heavy rocks, a pro process known to geologists as plucking. Rapid megafloods have formed canyons in the distant past as glacial ice dams release trapped water. Uh, you may remember the uh, Brett's floods in uh, uh, Washington State. Uh, large floods may be responsible for the formation of some Martian can canyons as well, the study suggests. Well, let's go to the original source here. This is uh, Michael Lamb and uh, uh, Fonstad uh, in 2010 and it's found in Nature Geoscience and one of the things that's interesting because it's starting to pop up now is that a lot of these uh, references that used to be behind journals are getting posted on the internet by their authors which means that you can read them for free. Um, now those of you who have been around a while may remember Michael Lamb. Michael Lamb, haven't I heard that name somewhere before? Well actually he published an article in Science in 2008 arguing that Box Canyon in Idaho resulted from a flood. And uh, the reference to the article is there. And uh, I did a talk in 2010 or so on uh, missed mega floods that uh, referenced uh, his, uh, his article rather extensively. So to get back to this one, uh, we'll look at the abstract. Deep river canyons are thought to form slowly over geological time. See, for example, reference one. 
cut by moderate flows that re reoccur every few years. And it's very interesting because the abstract has references. In contrast, some of the most spectacular canyons on Earth and Mars were probably carved rapidly during ancient mega flood events. And of interest, number four, it was written by J. Harlan Bretz. And number 12 was written by Michael Lamb. That's the Box Canyon one. Quantification of the flood discharge duration and, ex and erosion mecha mechanics that operate during such events is hampered because we lack modern analogs. We don't see it happening today. Canyon Lake Gorge, Texas, was carved in 2002 during a single catastrophic flood. The event offers a rare opportunity to analyze canyon formation and test paleohydraulic reconstruction techniques under known topographic and hydraulic conditions. So they're, they're going to calculate how much water it was, how, how fast it dug it, and how much it dug. And uh, you know, that's, that's gold for somebody who's studying uh, erosion uh, phenomena. Here we use digital topographic maps and visible near-infrared aerial images from before and after the flood, discharge measured during the event, field measurements, and sediment transport modeling to show that the flood moved meter-sized boulders, excavated about seven, meter, uh, seven meters of limestone and transformed a soil mantled valley into a bedrock canyon in just about three days. We find that canyon morphology is strongly dependent on rock type. Plucking of limestone blocks produced waterfalls, inner channels, and bedrock strath terraces, whereas abrasion of cemented alluvium, sculpted walls, plunge pools, and streamlined islands Canyon formation was so rapid that erosion might have been limited by the ability of the flow to transport sediment. We suggest that our results might improve hydraulic reconstructions of similar meta, uh, mega floods on Earth and Mars. And I think they're right about that. Most bedrock river canyons are thought to be cut slowly over millions of years. For example, Grand Canyon USA, reference one by moderate flows that reoccur every few years. The, you know, river rises to flood stage, takes a bunch of stuff out, and then it rises the next year, or perhaps five years later, depending on the drainage pattern and the rain and so forth. Uh, spectacular canyons on Earth and Mars exist, however, that were excavated rapidly in one of a series of cataclysmic flood events. And uh, there are those references again. Reconstructing flood discharge and duration is difficult, however, because we lack tested morphological me metrics and models of bedrock erosion during mega floods. This is in part because floods capable of rapidly carving bedrock canyons occur infrequently. Only a handful of examples exist on Earth, and most have been inferred from geologic evidence rather than observed directly. Herein we present an extraordinary example of formation of a bedrock canyon, Canyon Lake Gorge, Texas, under known hydraulic and topographic conditions during a single dam release flood event in 2002. This is nice. We get to see catastrophic flooding in action and see how powerful it can be. Before the flood, the 2.2 kilometer unmanaged valley consisted of a short 115-meter-long concrete canal at its most upstream end, an upper 1.2-kilometer reach that was steep, about 2 to 8 percent grade, soil mantled with a small creek and mesquite uh, and oak trees, and a 1-kilometer lower sloping, which is 0 0.6 to 2 percent grade, downstream reach. They approximately join at where the road is. The valley was intended to be used as an emergency spillway to connect Canyon Lake Reservoir to the Guadalupe River downstream of the dam, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So they knew it might happen. They wanted to be sure that it didn't just flood everywhere. And uh, they were lucky it worked for them. But how it worked is interesting. 
In 2002, the spillway was used for the first time, and the resulting flood excavated trees, sediment, bedrock, and a bridge that crossed the valley. valley. Figures 1B, C, and 2A, which we'll see in a minute, creating Canyon Lake Gorge. Canyon Lake Gorge has a top width of 365 meters at its most upstream extent, which is about one, 0.15 kilometers from the beginning, where X is the distance to the spillway entrance, set by the width of the concrete canal. The eroded gorge width decreases dramatically over the next 400 meters downstream and thereafter is approximately constant at about 50, 40, 60 meters. And here's the before shot, and uh, this is a topographic map, and you can see that there is a valley that runs along here, uh, and there's the spillway that allows the water to come through that. And then down here you can see there's only one line that uh, shows a, a dip. And um, there's the after, where you, uh, where you can see the, the erosion that's taking place. Uh, that's the bridge that uh, that's, was out that is now rebuilt. And you can see it gouged a pretty deep hole even in the, uh, uh, the relatively flat area. Uh, although this is easier to carve than the limestone was. And in th this area in the limestone, you can see several markers where they show uh, scour, rocks that have been abraded in a linear fashion. We'll see some photos of that in just a bit, or I should say a photo of that. In addition, they counted how many boulders they had here, here, and here, and um, we'll see a picture of some of those boulders. And there's the two photos together so that you can see them kind of side by side. Um, this one coming through uh, showing the original, and, and this uh, showing the uh, canyon being gouged out that's 20, uh, 23 feet deep or so, and in some places it goes all the way to 12 meters. Uh, here's a photo of the, uh, it's a little bit blurred because I've enlarged it from a uh, smaller photo, but you can see uh, the uh, water coming through pretty much at its height. Um, and you can see that the, the concrete spillway is just completely covered and you see the dam is, well it's hanging on but uh, it's a good thing it didn't, uh, didn't get too much higher. We might have had um, a complete dam break. Um, Post-flood topographic data, one meter resolution in the upper reaches, upper reach of the gorge, um, shows that vertical incision was anti-correlated with canyon width, which actually makes sense. That is to say, the narrower the canyon, the deeper it carved, or conversely, the wider the canyon, the less it carved where an average of 2.64 meters of incision occurred along the Thalweg. That's the very bottom of, of the, uh, it's the place where the water would go if you, if you dumped it eventually. Um, for X is less than 0 0.5 kilometers. In other words, uh, very early on it didn't dig that far. And an average of 7 0.2 meters of incision occurred for 0 0.5 kilometers to 1.2 kilometers, with the incision exceeding 12 meters locally. That's just about 40 feet. Figure 1C, and I'll show you figure 1C in just a minute. The stratigraphy in canyon sidewalls indicates that 90% of the erosion or so in the upstream reach is in the Cretaceous Glen Rose formation consisting of limestone, dolostone, and marl, 
with approximately 10% consisting of overlying soil mantle and alluvium. So, you know, it stripped off a little bit of soil and it just started digging into bedrock. And here's the, this is along what they call the thalweg, the, the lowest point. And you can see that it didn't dig too much at first, but then once it got out here, it started digging pretty consistently. And there's some places where this is 20 meters, so 10 meters is about there. So this is like 12 meters down, 40 feet down. Um, most of it a little less, but now you're starting to get into the 40 meters again. Erosion in the lower reach was into a quaternary fill terrace of the Guadalupe River, consisted, consisting of weakly cemented silt and sand. Kind of the same stuff we've got back in, uh, out back of Loma Linda. Um, from differencing pre and post flood digital topography, 2.3 times 10 to the fifth cubic meters of sediment and rock were eroded from the upper reach of the spillway. If you want to get an idea of that, each cubic meter is probably somewhere between two and three tons. So, actually, zero, 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 it would be 300,000 cubic meters. 2.3, well, let's see, 3 is 1,000, 10,000 is 4, 100,000, yeah, it's 200,000 cubic meters. That's a lot of rock. Um, Unfortunately, post-digital topography was not available in the lower reach, but field observations and aerial imagery, you know, as you look at it, and this is what it looks like it ought to have been and what it used to be, um, just kind of extrapolating to what was taken out, sort of like what we do with the great denudation, um, indicate a similar magnitude of incision, about seven meters, and total volume of erosion, about 2.3 times 10 to the 230,000 cubic meters. Transported boulders within the canyon are large, about one meter in diameter and tabular, flat, like a table. The dominant erosion mechanism was plucking, uh, where the water apparently ran across it and just lifted it out and floated it away. Um, abrasion appears to have contributed little to canyon formation in the upper reach. Most of the stuff is just plucked out. Uh, in the lower reach, uh, pardon me, in the upper reach, the, uh, the rocks lack flutes or potholes, and some show preserved Cretaceous wave ripple forms with no significant wear. And we're going to show you that supplementary figure here. Um, and you can see here's the Cretaceous ripple marks that were there in between the slabs. The slab were just lifted off and carried away, and the ripple marks were not polished off. They're pretty good sized ripples, yeah. Um, and here's a photo, and this is in the supplementary material as well, which um, I have put down the reference for, for those of you who want to look it up. Um, and it'll be in the uh, uh, in the references online as well. Uh, there's a pin, and you can see all these scratch marks on this rock. They're all running that way, the way the water was running. And that's called scour, and it's all over the place. And you know, it's not terribly surprising. The canyon floor in the upper reach of the gorge contains many vertical steps or nick points at various scales that are composed of one or more limestone beds. Um, and that's shown in the figure 1C that we've seen before. Uh, that's that little line that goes down. Uh, some nick points were waterfalls, show up to 9 meters of relief, 
and now form the head wall of an inner channel with horizontal bedrock terraces on either side. There is no evidence of prominent undercutting at the base of the, of the head walls as is, that is typically associated with waterfall retreat. So this is probably not waterfall retreat, it's just the way the stuff was plucked out. Instead, erosion appears to have occurred through plucking or sliding of slabs of bedrock exposed at vertical faces where the beds were unconstrained at their downstream boundaries. Just kind of slid off. And here's, here you can see this is the later stages of the flood. As the earlier stages, of course, covered all the way across. And then here is what's left afterwards. And you can just see the, you know, shelving that, but not much of a plunge pool. The cemented alluvium in the lower reach um, is massive and lacks the prominent bedding planes and vertical joints of the upper reach. So that's that, just cemented alluvium that they talked about. It is strong enough to f support a vertical face. It can give you cliffs, but collapses under the blow of a rock hammer. The result is that the longitudinal profile lacks nick points and steps, and the flood pathway contains two or more interweaving channels with about 20 meter long and about two meter wide streamlined islands of cemented alluvium in between, which are similar to some ancient mega flood features on Earth and Mars. And here's some of, uh, some of the islands, and you know, there's a person for scale. Um, the canyon also has undular walls, this is downstream, that appear to be remnants of large potholes, and we'll show them in just a minute, indicating erosion by abrasion. Significant numbers of large limestone boulders eroded further upstream were transported through the lower reach of the canyon. Some of these now cover the canyon floor, and we're going to show you a photo of that too. Um, although large boulders must have impacted the streamlined islands with substantial form, force, the smooth morphology suggests that abrasion by finer particles, potentially transported in suspended load, dominated erosion in this reach. If it was all big boulders, that you would see uh, unequal gouges, but you saw those islands were pretty well sculptured. Here's some streamlined islands. Doesn't that remind you of um, uh, Monument Valley or the uh, Merrimack and the Monitor or various other places out, out west? Um, I, and, or in fact, uh, Steamboat Island in um, uh, at Dry Falls in Washington State. So we know that these weren't there before, and we know they're near, there now, so they were formed by the flood, so we know that floods can do this. Uh, notice also potholes along the side, and what's even more interesting is, uh, if you look at it, is that the potholes seem to have this semicircular shape, um, kind of reminiscent of, uh, yeah, uh, so if you see semicircular can uh, canyon heads, it makes you wonder, maybe this was rapid uh, rather than slow erosion by undermining or whatever. And here's some of the boulders. And you can see a, a meter. Well, some of these look like they're a bit more than a meter. Um, Canyon Lake Gorge offers a rare opportunity to test techniques used to reconstruct ancient mega floods on Earth and Mars because it was formed under known discharge, flood duration, and pre- and post-flood topography. This indicates that canyon erosion occurred for 2.8 to 3.7 days when the flood exceeded this discharge. That is July 4 to July 8 in Figure 3a, which I haven't shown you, but you can look it up, which is consistent with eyewitness reports which are in the supplementary information. Yeah, we saw it, yeah. You know, there was some water running through there, but the really big flood was three days. It is difficult to identify morphologic features in Canyon Lake Gorge that indicate canyon formation during a three-day event. What? 
It is difficult to identify morphologic features in Canyon Lake Gorge that indicate canyon uh, formation during a three-day event versus a longer-lived flood or multiple events. For example, inner channels, nick points, and terraces are often formed slowly over geologic time in response to shifting climate or tectonic forces. Forcing. Are they really? Yes, but but no. I want you to notice it's difficult to tell the difference between Canyon Lake. According to, according to the article, this is what they're saying. It is difficult to tell the difference between Canyon Lake and stuff that's geologically old. Keep that thought. But in Canyon Lake Gorge and other mega floods, they must have formed rapidly through intrinsic instabilities in the erosion process. A narrow gorge is sometimes inferred to re represent slow, persistent erosion whereas Canyon Lake Gorge was formed in a matter of days. Slot canyons, anyone? It is clear that models for the rate of bedrock erosion are needed to calculate the duration of flooding necessary to excavate a canyon of known volume. Although notable progress has been made, there are no well-tested mechanistic models of bedrock erosion via, via plucking during mega floods, although I guess now there is. Instead, models for sediment flux can be used, which give a minimum estimate for duration if the rate of canyon formation was limited by the erosion of bedrock rather than the transport of sediment. We use the measured volume of excavation in the upper reach and a semi-empirical theory for sediment transport capacity, and our bed stress estimates from paleohydraulic reconstructions to calculate the flood duration. This analysis yields a time scale of canyon excavation of 0 0.6 days, assuming the canyon is inundated um, for the whole three days at, at, the, um, at its entire depth, which of course is nonsense because the first day it was still be busy digging. Um, and so that's a, that's a uh, that's a defective estimate, probably undershoots things. Uh, and 15 days using the th threshold for sediment suspension, which bracket the actual duration of canyon formation of about three days. It is surprising that this result is fairly reasonable given that supply limited erosion theories are most often, often applied to bedrock rivers. Bedrock rivers would uh, supply would say, well, no, you can't do it that fast. But he says, but we did. And I'm sorry, that, that's my ellipsis as well. It seems plausible that erosion of well-jointed rock by large floods might be extremely rapid, such that canyon formation is limited by the capacity of the flood to transport plucked blocks rather than the plucking process itself. In other words, what really limits how, how much you're going to dig is not how fast you can erode the bedrock. It is how fast can you carry away the rocks that you're eroding. Um, this, of course, has caught the attention of creationists, which through so, uh, one or two steps it got to me. And uh, unfortunately, the guy complains that creationist re researchers are not being referenced in the, uh, in the article, but, but he does make several of the points that I would make too. Uh, I would make two major points. Number one, floods can gouge canyons limited only by the ability of water to carry bedrock away. The idea that, uh, that this is really hard rock so it takes millions of years to wear through, well, you get a big enough flood and it'll wear through anyway. Um, number two, according to the article, it can be very hard to tell rapid erosion from conventional geologic processes. Now think about this for just a minute. If one does not assume that the conventional geological interpretation is largely correct, so these, this is really conventional geologic processes, 
The reverse can be argued. It can be argued that it is hard to tell features supposedly formed by conventional geologic processes from those made by catastrophic flooding, and that perhaps in many cases these features were really formed by catastrophic flooding rather than conventional processes. In other words, maybe some of those things were really catastrophic processes too. Now in my previous talk, Miss Mega Floods, I noted that although we are amateurs, uh, speaking for myself and many around me, conventional geologists may very well be amateurs also, and perhaps worse, as they have been trained to assume that certain features denote the long passage of time, when in fact those features don't denote that. And so they are automatically interpreting things in a long age perspective when they shouldn't be. They may, in some instances, be misled amateurs rather than professionals, and thus, in a sense, worse off than we are. But that's my opinion now. It's your turn. Go ahead. Just one question about the uh, explanation they gave. Uh, I'm not surprised that they did not mention cavitation. Did they mention cavitation? They did not mention cav the word cavitation. Yeah. Uh, they didn't discuss. Uh, you know, the plucking is kind of. That's what they were using as plucking. Of. But. Uh, but the you know the idea that cavitation could actually lift a rock right out of the ground. I suppose uh, it's it's more of a microscopic process, uh, and you, I would not expect cavitation here actually unless you had higher speeds that than, than we'd expect there. Uh, what well, it takes what, 100, 200 miles per hour, 300 miles per hour for cavitation. Uh, uh, which uh, well, no, it wouldn't have to be supersonic. <laughs> but uh, see, the thing of it is, there's the Bernoulli effect that you run things over. Uh, you know, uh, you you run uh, something over a surface, and the sidewise pressure actually drops, and so you get that uh, sucking sound. Cavitation means that it goes so fast that it actually creates vapor bubbles, if you like. And, and those bubbles, uh, once the pressure is released, usually downstream, collapse in on themselves and, and form shock waves. But uh, in any case, however you want to explain it mechanically, it is obvious that really fast rushing water can just lift rock and take it downstream a couple of kilometers, pile it up. They have an example from uh, the uh, Mount St. Helens in Washington breaking through that uh, uh, mud dam and uh, in 24 hours time eroded a 30 foot deep canyon that has all the little layers that are, it looks like a miniature Grand Canyon with all the little, little layers along the sidewall. Well, one of the things that I think is fascinating is to look and see how these little islands are just left there and eroded around <clears throat> on either side of them. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminds you of, of a lot of monument type stuff. Uh, we've mentioned uh, Steamboat Rock in, uh, in Dry Falls. It's between two large falls and it's just, it eroded on either side of them and then left this little thin narrow thing standing in. Uh, standing up in between, um, but you see, you see all kinds of monuments out in the uh, uh, in the southwest. Monument Valley being the, probably the classic example. And what's even more interesting is here is this here are these monuments standing out here with uh, some fill on either side of them, but not very much fill. And you ask yourself, where did the rest of the rock go? And you try to imagine that happening over millions of years of storm 
uh, slowly eroding away. Uh, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yes and yes. Go ahead. I, I find the, uh, the presence of those round vortices, uh, the term coke is, is applied at times uh, for these. Uh, these are where you see these in rivers. You know, when you go along a river, sometimes you see a kind of thing going round, round, round. A vortex, it's called normally. Yeah. Uh, this, I think, you can only have when you have a full body of water flowing through there. And so uh, it, uh, it tells you that this uh, was an unusual event and that uh, you can't attribute this or say, hey, this is difficult uh, to explain. Uh, uh, it could look like normal geological processes because of that. I would add to that that uh, we got some evidence of that in the Grand Canyon. Uh, you go down the uh, North Kaibab Trail uh, to the Red Wall, and man, you've got uh, vortex after vortex there. Uh, they call them, co uh, oh boy, and that name slips my, uh, but anyway, it, uh, alcoves. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they call them alcoves. And you've got some of those in the main part of the Grand Canyon also, about five of them right in a row there in the red wall uh, towards the uh, east end, uh, which I think uh, favor uh, this was cut by a major, major flood, not slow processes. Yes. There's another interesting geological formation. It's on the uh, road going north, uh, right along the New Mexico-Arizona border, going toward Farmington in Colorado, and it's called Shiprock. And the thing looks like a massive battleship just sitting out on this huge plain. And it's just a flat plain, and there's this huge, huge rock. That's, and it looks like a huge, and they call it Shiprock, and it looks like a huge battleship sitting out there. Uh -huh. Well, the Monitor and the Merrimack are the, the same general kind of formation as well. They're, uh, we've seen that, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and there's one in Utah that looks the same way that I brought some photos of once to, to show here. And it's, it's very, I mean, they're all over. And it raises some really interesting questions as to, uh, if they're formed this way, we are talking water that is unbelievably more than than what uh, than what carved this out. Mm -hmm. In fact, it would be interesting to ask the question as to how how much water you have to have in order to make that work. Um, it uh, it sounds like you could have a uh, pardon the expression a flood of biblical proportions. <laughs> yes. Just wondered how uh, how would the evolution explain that if it's supposed to be eroding over millions of years at well an even pace or evenly how could that or as my thinking off on there how could that big mm -hmm. Even like there's one that thing in Australia. How could it be left while everything else around it has been eroded away? Uh, well, it's, I mean, if you look at what happened here, you can see that there are islands that just stuck up there and, and the stream eroded around them and left them nicely streamlined. That's rapid. Oh, why, how do you do it slow? Well, it's very simple how you do it slow. You see, you turn to Charles Lyell. And you read that no forces are to be used except those existing today and in the approximate amounts that they exist today. And you realize that geology was built upon that ever since Charles Lyell. <laughs> in other words, well, the, no floods of any kind. 
you see, because we haven't seen them. Well, now we're seeing a small scale model and all of a sudden, well, we have evidence for flooding. But when you start looking at it, it turns out to be on a massive scale. Um, it's probably fair to call it a global scale. So how would geologists explain a, lo a slow, how would they explain a slow evolutionary oh. process to erode everything around it except that one? Well, you see, they've been doing this for 150, 200 years. They've been explaining it this way, and they've gotten really good at it. The question is whether it's a fact-based explanation. Uh, and that's the question we're raising. Yeah, a couple of comments related to that. Uh, you have the same problem with the great denudation and the staircase around the Grand Canyon. We, We've talked about this before here. Uh, why does the staircase exist uh, when just close to it are thousands of feet of material was eroded out, you know, maybe 9,000 feet anyway. Uh, but to get into uh, the specific question that she raised, uh, the uh, standard model, and this is a big question, folks, in geomorphology, and one that is, we have not explored uh, as we should have. Why uh, scarp retreat? If you get, uh, when you face uh, a body like my, uh, one of these uh, units in Monument Valley, the question is, why did erosion go horizontal instead of vertical because gravity pulls down? Now, the, the standard explanation is that, well, uh, moisture accumulates at the base. This tends to rot the rocks out and wash them out. Okay? Now, it's going to take a lot more than just a slow process of moisture to wash out. So it's not a very good model. Uh, but it's the standard, the standard model. But it does fulfill Lyle's um, dictates. Sure, but but it doesn't fit. The, uh, it doesn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, and uh, but uh, to to add to to this picture, folks, uh, there are major questions in geomorphology right now being raised about not just Monument Valley. We're talking about major scarps, uh, ridges that you find a hundred miles from shore. These are along the southeast coast of Australia. You find them on the southwest coast of India and uh, Africa. Huge scarps that are in from the edge of the continent. Why, why was erosion horizontal instead of vertical? This speaks so easily in terms of the receding waters of the flood compared to any explanations that you have otherwise. And I, I think we knew that this would be a great area for someone to look into in terms of uh, questions related to the standard geological interpretation. Let me see if I got that correctly. What you're talking about is a cliff coming out, dropping down, and then to see this, that, to, this to, whole thing is cleaned out at to, the base of the cliff. For 100 miles until you get to the sea. These are these huge scarps we have there. There's one in South America, too, uh, along the coast of Brazil. Well, for that matter, there are scarps all the way through... Uh, the American Southwest, where wow, in, yeah. in, 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 in the Vermilion Cliffs, absolutely, and, uh, and this is one of the major why. Why in dry environments do you have these sharp scarps? Uh, it's, the question's been there for fifty years. 
I can remember listening to a geologist in San Francisco or a geological society meeting. He says, we don't know how to explain these scarps. So, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, take courage, folks. There's a lot of information out there. It's very interesting. I was just wondering if a possible um, explanation might be uh, some giant tsunamis that could be uh, concurrent uh, with the upheaval and volcanic activity and, uh, you know. Well, that's a possibility except for one thing. Those giant tsunamis are not seen today, so you can't use them. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Let me add one comment to this uh, SCARP thing. The explanation they're using right now is they're saying, well, uh, these, this had to be early when things were unstable, when the continents separated. That's, that's their explanation, which, you know, uh, fits very well into our interpretation also. Now, th there is one other thing that I... Uh, uh, that I, I think is interesting in this regard, and that is uh, uh, you, have, you have these restrictions that you can't, you can't bypass. And now we're having evidence that we should be bypassing them. Uh, we, should be, we should be looking at all kinds of formations with, if you can put it that way, new eyes to start looking at what kind of formations, does it take one giant wave? Does it take uh, a, a certain amount of erosion? Last week we saw that, that if you want to dig a really deep canyon, it's far more effective to run the water continuously rather than trying to dump a flash flood into it. And I think that that's something we have to keep in mind. We're, we're going to have to start asking, well, how much water does it take? And, it, you know, if it takes a little water, then we'll say it takes a little water. And if it takes giant amounts of water, then we start saying, well, it takes giant amounts of water. And here's how much. And then you start, and then you start asking, well, have we seen this kind of stuff on Earth before? And if the answer is no, well, maybe conditions in the past were not the same as they are today. I, one, other, one other thing that's interesting, and that is that uh, there's evidence, for example, when the Shinarump goes over the Mon Kopi in some places, that both layers are still soft. And it raises the question of whether you could dig some of these features a little faster if the cementation process is not as complete as it is today. And there's supposed to be 10 million years between those two layers. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, the, <laughs> the Mon Kopi just sat there soft for 10 million years, didn't erode or anything, just sat there soft. And didn't have wormholes in it either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it, 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 by the way, uh, sorry, um, they calculated the amount of material removed because obviously you can just see the before and after it. Right, and all you have to do is how volume. much stuff is gone, and well, it's 2.3. Yes. Uh, I mean, 230,000 cubic meters, all right. Great. Did they at all calculate the amount of water that was involved? Uh, actually, they did, and they have they have numbers for that. And uh, I mean, well, they have you know ranges, uh, estimate ranges, uh, and uh, it's instructive to ask that question. And to uh, obviously, it's well within the range of how much rain falls in Texas in some places. When you move into a, uh, the possibility of a major flood involved here, I'm speaking of the Genesis flood, global flood, you can raise the question of how, endure, how endured the rocks were. Uh, this, the picture is not all that simple per se, but, but when you consider, since we're looking at this uh, very topography. When you consider the surface of the Earth at present, its irregular topography compared to the flat layers, and you can see right there 
uh, how the the limestone is pretty flat. This uh, there's no way you could lay down those layers that we have now on our present continents uh, because you have to have a very flat surface to lay these on. Which raises an interesting question. Are we now arguing for the American Southwest originally being a giant basin that could be underwater? Well, it, that, it that, seems that way. It, it's, I mean, it had to be go rapid. And when you have these gaps in between and there's no erosion to speak of there, uh, I mean, it's a very strong case that, uh, to me at least, when I see that material out there, I am fairly convinced. I, the model is this was laid down rapidly during the flood. It was eroded out in part by the receding waters of the flood. This explains your flat layers, explains the irregular topography. Uh, uh, to me, that is the simplest explanation for the data out there. Oh, by the way, the, the, the people involved in this are getting scared. And the reason I say that is because I have seen various proposals for how you dig the, can the Grand Canyon in the six million years, doing this, doing that, whatever. But there is actually an article out there that's saying the Grand Canyon was not done by a catastrophic flood. And it will be interesting to bring that article here and take a look at it. it what it says is that these people are, are hearing hoofbeats behind them and they're saying there are no horses, there cannot be horses. Uh, there are six different models of how the Grand Canyon got eroded. But the one model that will not work is a massive flood. That one is not mentioned. It's well, not now it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the models as well is cut partly by three different things. Another one, river went out uh, up north up through Canada out into the Atlantic. I mean, you, you want to see wild IDs, just go look in the literature about how the Grand Canyon was cut. Anyway, we have one comment here, one back there, and in the front as well. When uh, they talk about water, it, uh, this uh, actually is not pure water that's flowing with, that's uh, cutting these out because it's flowing mud, and it's basically thick, thick sandpaper that's uh, flowing down uh, the uh, stream bed and it's not f fresh, pure water that is crystal clear water. Have it's mud. It's mud Col and it's, sand it's moving sandpaper. Yeah. Have you ever been to the Colorado? You know why it's called the Colorado? It's because it's red. <laughs> Me? Yeah, and then uh, we'll move it up. This may be another subject, but how does this relate to the claims about there being different life forms in each one of these levels? How is that explained? Mm -hmm. It doesn't directly relate to it. It relates to the rapidity of canyon formation in particular and also the rapidity of formation. Of, if, if Monument Valley was done by sheet erosion, which is what it's looking like, then the sheet of water that's coming is so massive that, like I say, you're talking about a flood of biblical proportions. Um, to, to just briefly to address this particular question, the way it relates is that once you allow for the possibility of the flood, then you also present a possibility for the explanation of all the sedimentary layers, including all the fossils in them. See, that is why the whole story of the flood has to be excluded in order to be able to continue to explain the sedimentary layers in terms of gazillions of years. Go ahead. What this whole discussion says to me is that we have a rather flawed educational system in this sense. We teach students that what the professor says and what's written in the book is true, but we don't teach them to say, how do you know? 
and why, and all kinds of the very basic questions. Why do we still listen to Lael? Somebody should be asking mm -hmm. all professors that and, and forcing there to be an examination of the bedrock of what we teach. There's a lot of really good science going on, but when it's based on a flawed premise, then it can just go anywhere. Well, the, the interpretations get more and more strained as you add more and more information. And I mean, what you'd like is a system where it interlocks tighter and tighter and it reinforces right. itself. Right. But sometimes you wind up building a house of cards. And when you are building a house of cards, uh, it, it, it should bother you that the system is that shaky. It really should. Uh, I'm interested because in education, one of the things that we are taught is critical thinking. <laughs> we're taught to think critically, but we're not taught how. Very seldom do we teach students how to think critically because the professor is the ultimate answer. Well, yes. If you don't believe that, don't give the answer he wants on the test. Yes. Uh, and, and that's a problem because you should be able to give another answer and give justification for it. There are a few pros professors out there who actually do that, yeah. but there are not very many. That's right. And the earlier you are, the less that happens. Well, maybe that's not even true. <laughs> Paul? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. and then we'll come back. I want to come back to the question that was raised, which is a very important one, about the order in the fossils. Why do we have that order there? Uh, I do see the sediments out there as rather overwhelming evidence for the flood, at least that's the best explanation. The fossil record is not as easily explained. We have some good explanations for it, but they also, the sequence we have in the fossil does fit rather nicely with the evolutionary process in that you have simpler organisms down below, then you have in the middle, then you have at the top. Uh, Although we, I would we, actually we, dispute that, and, then, and I think that's an artifact of people telling us where to look. Uh, and you, I'll tell you why. I, I, would, I would dispute that because... You, <laughs> no, no one has ever found a mammal in the Grand Canyon in all those layers. No, and I agree with that. And here's the <laughs> point. Vertebrates do follow a pretty good sequence. Don't but try that with ammonites. You're right, but then all we study is vertebrates because because uh, they're more interesting and so on. But but my point is, you know, go back mm -hmm. and look at um, look at sponges, mm -hmm. look at um, you know anything other than vertebrates, and you mm -hmm. won't get that sequence. Right. Right. But uh, just to go on with that question there, uh, if we buried the present Earth at present, you'd also have a sequence from very simple organisms in the rocks to marine organisms next to others. So the sequence is there if it were buried by a gradual flood, and, and flood, floods would be gradual. So uh, we're not uh, without some plausible explanations for it, but and, the and, question needs and, to be addressed, and mm -hmm. uh, not everything falls exactly perfectly into what we think it might be. I think the ecology before the flood was different than the present ecology to a certain extent, but in major areas it was the same. I think there's also the uh, taphonomy helps a little bit. That is to say, Amphibians don't float after they die as long as reptiles, which don't float as long as they die uh, as birds and mammals do. And that happens to also be the sequence. I don't think that's the whole explanation, but it may explain some of the sorting. The final thing is, and this is really important, tracks come before animals. And in fact, in certain cases, it gets really embarrassing because there are bird tracks in the Triassic. And what happens is that when you get that kind of problem, 
they go back and they say, that can't be bird tracks. They started out and they thought it were reptile tracks, except that the reptile tracks landed. So these things flew. They're birds. They're birds. Everybody now knows they're birds. So they went back and something that had been securely dated by index fossils, which is supposed to be the best way, <coughs> and by radiometric dating, argon-argon, which is the best radiometric dating method. And so somebody went back and redated them with lead-lead, and now they're no longer in the Triassic. They're, I've eocene. got eocene. They're eocene. So now, of course, they're eocene birds. Everybody knows that. So what happens is the evidence gets worked with until it fits the, the theory. We had a talk on this, what, a year or two ago? Uh, with all the references and everything. It, it was just amazing. So uh, this is part of critical thinking, to start asking yourself, well, how do they know? I read widely, but not very deeply. But I'm fascinated by all the new discoveries that are being made in science. But in every article, of these, almost every article that you read on new discoveries, there is a phrase similar to, this will cause us to rethink our understanding of evolution. Rethink our evolution, our, our, our understanding of origins. Rethink. They're in a quandary, and I'm losing faith. <laughs> It's a it's a common it's a common dictum in science that uh, you know well we were wrong in the past but this time we've got it right it's different now boy so I shouldn't lose faith well just look at your it, history it depends they'll be on saying this for decades in. time less it depends on what you've got your faith in I, I would recommend faith in truth. What is truth? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we may come back to this if I get some more information that I think is uh, useful and interesting. But um, next week we'll uh, we'll look at uh, what the what the evolutionists say. Well, let's see, evolutionists. Uh, the naturalists, maybe that's a better way of putting it. What the naturalists say when they think we're not listening. Fascinating article that comes out on the origin of life. And uh, so stay tuned for next week.